starts right now. A confrontation caught on camera. The defender is getting a copy of the video that shows a city councilman from Castle Hills at the center of the controversy. What the Castle Hills mayor is saying coming up. But first. So here's something for you to keep in mind. If you plan to party on St. Mary Street, this is going to be the last weekend before most business owners there change the way they do things. During a community meeting tonight, there appear to be some compromise between most business owners and neighbors concerned about trash, safety, and parking problems. That's right. The night team's Patty Santos is live along the St. Mary Strip. And Patty, if you could hear me with all that noise there, are people there satisfied with today's agreement? Well, some residents are really waiting to see it before they believe it, but for the most part, businesses here on the St. Mary's Strip have voluntarily signed what is being called an operating standard, and some of the solutions that they've come up with are pretty similar to what another entertainment community in Texas has already tried. I understand you're upset. Tobin Hill homeowners are ready to get their streets and security back. In a meeting at St. Sophia Church, 16 of 19 business owners agreed to raise drink prices, set entry age to 21 years old, and set up a weekend morning street cleaning crew. Negotiating is business, so you're not going to walk away 100% happy. We're not going to walk away 100% happy, but at least we walk away like, hey, you know what, we got... What we needed to get done, and I feel a lot better than when we started. SAPD will begin to limit residential parking and place seven officers to enforce street closures starting next weekend. A separate parking study will reveal a more permanent solution in May. But ride share will be the future of those visiting the St. Mary Strip. We need more little areas where ride share can pick up and drop off passengers safely instead of just pulling on the side of the street. Some residents are skeptical, others are optimistic. They just need to be willing to accept and realize nothing's going to happen overnight. Safety and maintenance concerns also face the Deep Elm Entertainment District in Dallas. In the 90s, they formed the nonprofit foundation to handle those issues. We kind of sit at the middle of all those things and are an advocate on behalf of Deep Elm. <laughs> Executive Director Stephanie Huberg of the Deep Ellum Foundation says the city of Dallas funds the nonprofit to promote stability. The goal was to say, how can we make sure that we have a well-rounded growth and continue this kind of path as opposed to um, see boom and bust cycles. Huberg says communication is the first step to finding a solution. There's a lot of ground that can be gained by just having that joint understanding. And businesses here have agreed to pay into a fund that will help hire off-duty Bear County Sheriff deputies to patrol this area. And that is still in the works. We should hear more about that in the coming weeks. But the idea is that this entire community will really come together in the next couple of years. Live on the St. Mary Strip, Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Patty. We'll make sure to keep an eye on that. Right now, the search is on for a man accused of trying to run, own, run over his own uncle and in the process causing property damage. Bear County deputies need your help finding 26-year-old Andrew John Herrera. Deputies say it all started when Herrera and his uncle argued over tools that didn't belong to Herrera but that he sold. Investigators explain Herrera got into his truck and drove towards his uncle. The uncle was able to jump out of the way, but Herrera hit a parked truck, which then pushed into the porch of the home. Deputies chased Herrera, but he got away. If you know where he is, call the sheriff's office at 210-335-6000. Now an evening bike ride turned deadly. Police say that a man was riding his bike on a trail right near Loop 410 in Starcrest. Officers say that for some reason, the bicyclist veered off that trail and got hit. Everybody involved in that crash stayed at the scene, but the man was pronounced dead. Police have not yet revealed his name. Several shootings in San Antonio today. Tonight, the search is on to find who shot a 14-year-old boy. It happened just outside an apartment on the city's southwest side. Officers taped off a section of the Guild Apartments, Guild Park Apartments on West Mayfield. That's not too far from Zarzamora on Southwest Military. Police tried speaking with several witnesses, but investigators say they're not cooperating. The 14-year-old boy was taken to the hospital. In a separate case, one man was shot while pumping gas. This was at the corner store near 410 and Vance Jackson. Police say a man came up to the driver and shot him before running away. Officers caught up with the suspect a few blocks away, but it's unclear what led to the shooting or if there's a motive. The victim was rushed to the hospital in critical condition.
New tonight, a Castle Hill City Councilman was captured on camera accosting two women at an antique shop, accusing them of racial profiling and threatening to discourage people in his own town from going to that store. The night team's Dylan Collier obtained the footage, uncovered what led to the incident, and also has more on the city's decision not to punish the councilman. It's tonight's Defenders Investigation. <laughs> Last August, this gentleman walked into Armadillo Antiques and more, and while carrying a magazine and a Starbucks bag, proceeded to look around before leaving a short time later, holding the same items he walked in with. What is it? I don't know. He broke down. Surveillance footage shows the two women working behind the store's counter thought he may have taken something from the shop. After one of them followed him outside, the man quickly cleared up the confusion as he had not taken anything from the shop. An hour later, in walked Douglas Gregory, who quickly offered an introduction of who he was and why he was there. Yes, my name is Douglas Gregory. I'm on the city council over here in the council constituent call. Gregory, for the next 12 minutes, berated the women, going as far as to say there would be consequences for the store. That's shame. And you don't go after somebody and say, what are you holding when he's walking out of your shop? That is racial profiling, and that is racist. And let me tell you, I know every single person in Castle Hill. And if they ever ask me about this shop, I will simply say, avoid it. This is, this is shameful behavior. Despite both women claiming they weren't racially profiling and weren't aggressive when approaching the man, Gregory's diatribe continued, driving customers from the shop until a woman off camera finally told Gregory to give it a rest. Will you tell the mayor how hostile you're being to these ladies? I'm a Hispanic All woman. All I'm saying is I'm They upset. have apologized profusely. I'm not and the one they who heard did. your point. One of the employees told the defenders off camera she's still shaken by the incident seven months later. And even though she didn't feel physically threatened by the councilman, she's afraid to follow anyone out of the store. Gregory's actions were reported to Castle Hills Police, which then got a copy of the footage. The department's police chief determined that nothing criminal took place and that the incident had actually occurred just outside city limits. So it's important to note that... Castle Hills Mayor J.R. Trevino called the situation unfortunate and said he personally apologized to the store's owner, but after consulting with the city attorney, determined no action could be taken against Gregory. I can't say that I agree with the way that uh, Mr. Gregory conducted himself, but I can appreciate his concerns that uh, somebody was singled out. Gregory, who declined an offer from the defenders to give his side of the story on camera, told us in a phone interview last month, quote, I can say it would have been more gentlemanly to be less passionate and was adamant racial profiling had taken place. And I don't want this on tape. Gregory, you may recall, was publicly censured by counsel in 2018 after a defender's investigation revealed he had pressured city staff to move the road he lives on up the city's street repair list, placing it close to the top. Council had weighed banning Gregory from being chairman of any city committees, but ultimately just censured him. For the defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Douglas Gregory says that after the incident, he returned to the store and cleared, cleared up the issue with the owner. But one of the employees says that Gregory has not apologized to her or the other woman that he was seen yelling at. A legacy full of memories now lost. Many of you at home shared your very own with us on social media after learning about the fire that swept through Hakala. It's a Mexican restaurant on the west side that welcomed customers since 1949. Luckily, no one was hurt. John Smetzer described it as a heartbreaking loss. He shared this picture saying the restaurant was a staple for celebrations in his family for the last 54 years. Steve Trevino says he and his wife had their wedding dinner there. The loss even hitting home for the San Antonio Fire Department, who said it was a sad day in San Antonio for the beloved restaurant. Now, on the bright side, employees at Hakala have been offered jobs at another restaurant called La Fogata. Now, this is a story we will continue to follow online at KSAT.com. Fans we've heard from say they hope the owners will rebuild. As for a cause of the fire, that has not been determined. You can download the KSAT app to get any updates direct to your phone.
We actually have a cold front headed our way. It's right now moved, just moved into the Hill Country and the Del Rio area. We're going to talk about its biggest impacts on your Friday, the weekend, and even our next chance of rain when that comes in just a bit. Plus, more families are visiting the San Antonio Zoo this time of year. If you're hoping to do the same, we have the peak times you may want to consider avoiding if you don't want to run into large crowds. It's coming up. Also, a new cancer treatment one step closer to coming to San Antonio. We're going to discuss the deal that City Council passed next on the Nightbeat. The war in Ukraine is now in its fourth week. The death toll is rising as Russia's army is facing a fierce resistance from Ukrainian fighters. The UK Defense Ministry says it believes, quote, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has largely stalled on all fronts, end quote. Meanwhile, Russia continues to launch airstrikes. Some of them have hit civilians. And there is a search for survivors at a theater in Mariupol that served as a mass shelter. The building was hit despite satellite images showing a warning that children were inside. All of this as, as Kosovo's president is asking the U.S. to help them become a NATO member as Russia tries to destabilize the Balkans. And now for a look at some of the other big headlines tonight. Investigators say that a 13-year-old boy was behind the wheel of the truck that ran into a van head-on in West Texas. Nine people were killed, including golfer and former Pleasanton High School student Travis Garcia. It just hit me like if I try to text him now or call him. You know, no one's going to pick up. So that's kind of when reality kind of set in. You have to feel for his friends and family. Those who knew Garcia are still trying to process this news. The National Transportation Safety Board is also revealing what may have caused the truck to veer into the bus. Investigators say that the truck had a spare that blew out right before the crash. San Antonio, one step closer to expanding cancer treatment. City Council greenlit a proposal that would create a proton therapy center. UT Health San Antonio would work with Proton International in this effort. And instead of X-ray radiation, this treatment would use beams of protons to target tumors, specific tumors, and reduce side effects. Another big plus here is that that center would bring 27 jobs to San Antonio. Also, San Antonio celebrating St. Patrick's Day in style. Not only were the people decked out in green, so was the river. So just take a look at this. You can't really see it from here, but the river was given its green color with an environmentally friendly green dye. And then on Saturday, the river is going to be dyed again green between 1 and 3 p.m. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. Lots of green everywhere. Mm -hmm. Spring break means a boost in visitors. That includes families looking to spend time at the San Antonio Zoo. Officials say they're seeing higher attendance compared to years past, and the city has even put a traffic plan in place to help drivers. But if you're trying to avoid the crowds, the zoo says their peak hours are between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m., and that's expected to continue throughout the weekend. Now, part of the reason that's so packed is because we've had some amazing weather. Very nice weather. As a matter of fact, we're looking out live here, uh, live along 410 near the airport. 68 degrees right now. And of course, things look pretty calm right now, but we're going to be dealing with some wind, Adam. Yeah, we are. That's the main headline. There's a cold front that's headed our way. and It's going to move through around midnight, but it's not going to affect our temperatures all that much. It's mainly going to set the stage for a windy Friday. Get ready for that. And then Saturday and Sunday, we'll have those cool mornings where you want long sleeves, but by the afternoon, shorts and short sleeves, the big temperature range during the day. And then our next storm chance comes on Monday. Wait till you see where that system currently is. Let's get to it all starting right now. Uh, take a look at the wind gusts across the state. Look at Lubbock, Midland gusting to 38, 36 miles per hour, respectively. That kind of wind is headed our way. It's not out there right now, but it's going to be here first thing in the morning. When you wake up, you're going to notice the wind. Here's our forecast by 5 a.m. gusts up to about 40 miles per hour, and that's going to be the case for a good portion of the day tomorrow. So a northwesterly wind steady at 15 to 25 and at times gusting up to 40. If it's trash or recycling day, once that truck comes by and empties that bin, likely to topple over, maybe even blow down the street a little bit. All right, so the cold front not giving us any rain. What we could really use is, of course, moisture and rainfall. It's just the cold front's going to give us wind and more dry air, which is not what we need. Here's the latest drought monitor. This red area indicating extreme drought, Eagle Pass to Pleasanton, uh, even Bigfoot Divine area, Lytle. This is continuing to creep 
further into the KSAT 12 viewing area. So we're falling deeper and deeper into drought. 91% of the state is considered in drought. And look at the panhandle as well, extreme to exceptional drought. That's actually where we're getting some moisture tonight. Earlier today and tonight, a little bit of moisture there. This is associated with some severe weather and actually the cold front that's moving through our area. A lot of moisture though associated with this system here that's centered over Oklahoma. You can see East Texas, some rain, Louisiana, Arkansas, moisture stretching into Oklahoma, Kansas, even New Mexico and Colorado. Everybody but our part of Texas basically is getting some moisture from that system. It's too far north for us. We're staying dry. We have to go to Alaska to find our next system that could give us some rainfall. Right now it's just southeast of the Aleutian Islands. That's going to continue to drop southward and indications remain that it would be in a more favorable position to give us some energy to generate some showers and thunderstorms by Monday. Nothing but sunshine, high and dry Friday, Saturday and Sunday. But by Monday we could wake up to a few light showers and in the afternoon and evening some scattered storms are possible. And it's a fluid situation, a lot of time between now and then. And we will be fine tuning this forecast and having more details in the days ahead. So definitely check back in also because if it pans out, we could see some severe weather as well. All right, let's talk temperatures for the most part right near 70 degrees. Pleasanton, Kennedy, Gonzalez at 70, New Braunfels, San Antonio 67, Stinson 73, Rio Medina 63 degrees and Comfort 63. And by tomorrow morning, despite a cold front moving through, it's not going to be cold. We'll be right near 50 degrees to start the day tomorrow. Then by the afternoon, we get well into the 70s again. Kerrville, only about 71, Comfort 73, but Floresville, Poteet, Divine, 78. And I think in San Antonio, about 74 for the high temperature. Wall to wall sunshine tomorrow. But remember that gusty wind out of the northwest at times up to 40 miles per hour. And that's going to be first thing in the morning. Saturday, mid 40s in the morning, then near 80 by the afternoon. So there's that cool morning but comfortably warm afternoon similar on sunday but the wind's going to pick up again on sunday it's just going to be coming off the gulf of mexico so that's going to set the stage for a humid monday with that potential for some scattered showers and storms and the only chance of rain in the seven day forecast definitely some good weather to look forward to hopefully those rain chances bump up just a bit thanks for that adam yeah we need that rain Okay, we got to talk about the Cowboys. Mm -hmm. What is going on? A lot of goings. <laughs> yeah, a lot of Cowboy fans are asking that question tonight. We already got uh, Mari Cooper gone on a trade. Connor Williams is signed now with Miami. Just the latest here, they've released their starting right tackle. What the heck is going on in Dallas? And Lonnie's newfound confidence, where did he get it from? Coming up. I can't come into the game all soft and lollygagging. You know, I just got to attack the rim and um, just keep on doing what I've been doing these past um, two weeks. Lonnie Walker, the fourth, saves the day with another 20-point game, including the game winner in Big Board Sports. Who is behind his reborn confidence tonight? You will find out in Big Board Sports, but first. Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys almost seem to be in a self-destructive mode at the start of the NFL's league season this week. They've already treated away star wide receiver Mari Cooper, so they can't re-sign Michael Gallup for five years, $62.5 million, even though Gallup will miss all of the offseason while he recovers from a torn ACL, not available before September. They have also lost wide receiver Cedric Wilson to Miami for three years, $22.8 million. The Dolphins also signed Cowboys offensive lineman Connor Williams to a two-year $14 million deal. Not too many tears over that, though. But now today's decision to release starting right tackle Leo Collins. The move is expected to save the Cowboys $10 million. Houston, Texas quarterback Deshaun Watson has informed the Cleveland Browns that they will not be a part of trade talks for his services. That leaves the New Orleans Saints. And now the Atlanta Falcons left on Watson's list to play for next after telling the Carolina Panthers tonight they're out of the running as well. But the move by the Browns flying to Houston to meet with Watson has driven a wedge between the Browns front office and their star quarterback Baker Mayfield. Today he requested a trade telling us he's nobody's plan B but the Browns have denied that request and that has led to some very bad feelings.
Lonnie Walker IV has a newfound confidence has led him to score 20 or more points in six of his last 10 games, including last night against the Oklahoma City Thunder. In fact, Walker had four three-pointers, including the game-winning basket against the Thunder to propel the Spurs to a 122-120 victory. And get this, he did it in front of four-time NBA champions Tony Parker and Manu Ginobili, who have to attend last night's game at the AT&T Center. Kind of ironic when you listen to Lonnie tell us who has helped him with building his confidence up in his fourth year in the NBA. I'm getting more and more comfortable as the season proceeds, as the games go on. And, um, you know, I'm truly thankful for my coaches, Manu, um, you know, Keldon, and DJ, the team. Um, they instill a lot of confidence in me to allow me to play freely and, and, and do what I do. So um, if it wasn't for them, I don't know how well I'll be doing, if I'm still in a slump or whatnot. But, um, you know, I'm thankful that I'm in this position right now. All right, another must win tomorrow night when they play host to the Pelicans. NBA superstar Steph Curry is out for the rest of the regular season after suffering a left foot sprain during last night's game against the Celtics. That's when boss's Marcus Smart dove for a loose ball, rolled over Curry's ankle and foot. He's expected to be ready, though, for the playoffs. Former Dallas Mavericks general manager Donnie Nelson has sued the NBA franchise, alleging that team owner Mark Cuban fired him last summer in retaliation for reporting Cuban's chief of staff, Jason Ludden, sexually harassed and sexually assaulted his nephew in his hotel room during the 2020 All-Star Weekend in Chicago. According to ESPN, Nelson also alleges in that law that Cuban offered him $52 million to withdraw a wrongful termination claim and sign a confidentiality agreement. In an email to ESPN, Cuban denied the allegation, saying everything in that filing is a lie. The detention of former Baylor, now WNBA star Brittany Griner in Russia has been extended to May 19th. It's after Russian officials say a search of her luggage back on February the 17th revealed vape cartridges containing oil that is derived from cannabis. Griner has actually played in Russia for the last seven years, earning over $1 million per season. March Madness is underway with bracket busters already. Next. The Big Dad tip out this morning at all arenas across the country. The defending champs and number one in the East Region, the Baylor Bears, playing up the road in Fort Worth against number 16, Norfolk State. Bears showed their teeth early, already up six. Matthew Mayer in the corner for the three, and it's a nine-point game. Mayer again for the three, and it's an 11-point lead. Final seconds of the first half, Bears pushing the pace. Jeremy Sochan to Mayer for the two-handed punch. Bears go into the half with a 43-27 lead. Mayer still not done, curls off the screen at the top, hits another three. Bears keep rolling with a 46-30 lead. Mayor with a career-high 22 points to lead Baylor to that 85-49 win. And what would March Madness be without an upset? Of course, a pretty good one here in the Midwest region. Number 5, Iowa, taking on number 12, Richmond. Let's get right to the action. The Richmond Spiders are up four with under 30s to play. Iowa steals the inbounds pass. Keegan Murray gets the jumper to fall to make it a two-point game. Richmond hits two free throws to push the lead back up to four. Iowa inbounding. It's a lob to Keegan Murray for the alley-oop. But Richmond hits their free throws. It is over, and it's a four-point game with two seconds to play. And the Spiders knock out the Hawks. 67-63 in the South Region, by the way, which is coming to San Antonio eventually for the Sweet 16 and the Elite 8. Colorado State, as you can see there, falls to Michigan, 75-63. And Tennessee over Longwood, 88-56. A huge upset tonight. This is in the East Regional. 15 seed St. Peter's knocks off number two seeded Kentucky, 85-79 in overtime. That right there is the big bracket busters so far. I know a lot of people had them in their final four. Not anymore. Sorry. And even some of the big names, other big names like Gonzaga, the overall seed, they started Struggle. off very slow in the first half. They got it together, but I had Kentucky going to the Elite Eight. Uh, My bracket's not looking too good. <laughs> Another reason to drink tonight. Absolutely. <laughs> right. We'll be right back after this. So before we go, we got to talk about this because it fits in with today's holiday. So that woman you see right there is into collecting four leaf clovers and she's had so many that she's going for a world record doing it. So that's Bettina Reich. She's been finding four leaf clovers since she was 10 years old. She's a grown woman now. She found rare clovers for 112 days in a row in 2020 alone. And now she's applying to put her collection in the Guinness World Record book. And that is a patient woman right there. And a lucky one. Yeah, exactly. And she right? got to have a little bit of luck, luck of the Irish. Yeah. It's time to hit go. the lotto. I don't know. This Maybe. is true. <laughs> she put in some time, too. <laughs> I know. I always feel like I'm looking for them when I see clovers. I never once found one. Maybe it's my lack of patience. Anyway, 70s, mid to upper 70s next few days. Windy as well. Friday and Sunday. Chance of storms Monday. Perfect. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure having you with us tonight. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching. Good night.